We're going to uh, begin here shortly. We have a few more people coming in the room. By the way, just Betty, just stop right where you are. This lecture this afternoon is co-hosted by Minatrista, and standing in the back of the room is the new executive director for Minatrista, Betty Brewer, and her husband. So welcome to the College of Architecture and Planning, and thank you for co-sponsoring this event with us. So perfect timing on your part. Before we get started, we also have guests here from the Indianapolis Art Museum. Where are you? Just, just one of you? Welcome. Welcome to the college. Welcome to the College of Architecture and Planning. Nice to have you here. Um, uh, there are a lot of guests here this afternoon, I think. There are some, some other people who will be coming in from Minatrista. And before uh, Malcolm Cairns introduces Pat Doherty, I'm going to just uh, make a few remarks here. First of all, I wanted to, uh, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Joe Bellello. I'm Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning, and we're delighted to have you here for our second uh, guest lecture of this semester. We will be having our third installment next week when uh, two Disney Imagineers, two of the project uh, architects for Disney Imagineering, uh, Bob Sakita and Steve Grant, will be here to talk about their work for Disney Imagineering. Their principal project architects have an interesting body of work to share. They will be here on Monday at 4 o'clock and uh, come early because I know there's a bunch of people from ac across campus who are also coming, so we anticipate this will be a full room for that afternoon. Later in the week also, we will be, uh, there are three conferences in and around Muncie. There's one here in Muncie, uh, a regional neighborhoods conference that starts next Thursday. There is also the Ohio Valley uh, AIA conference in Indianapolis at the Marriott Hotel downtown, which students can attend the principal lectures for for free. Uh, those will be posted next week. And thirdly, uh, last week you heard from Bob Kester, who is the director of series, that the greening of the campus will also start next Thursday. The plenary sessions for that, about three every day, are also free. The other thing I wanted to say, I know that many of you have uh, been um, seized by the quandaries down in New Orleans and down in the south, and, and there's been a great deal of effort by many of you to get us involved. Uh, finally, yesterday, the university came up with a policy in that regard, and I know the architecture department faculty voted, I think, unanimously to get us involved, to enable students who are from Tulane in particular to take classes here during the fall semester. We know also that they're intent on having that university running again by the spring. That may be optimistic, but I think that they hope to be there by the spring, but we finally have clearance to go ahead and begin to uh, offer students who might want to come back here, who may be Indiana-based or may have some particular affinity to our university, to come back and join us during this uh, uh, tragic fall semester uh, for them. But uh, you should be assured that the outpouring of support from all the schools of architecture and planning nationally has been huge, and uh, I think I'm sure they feel um, well embraced by all of us in this uh, very difficult time for them. Uh, with that, I want to turn the podium over to Malcolm Cairns, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks. I also would like to welcome everyone here today, and uh, I have a couple of um, additional acknowledgments to make uh, as far as uh, the program is concerned. I want to um, sort of reinforce Joe's welcome of our partners from Minatrista, and this event is co-hosted in addition to the College of Architecture and Planning and Minatrista. In addition to Betty Brewer, who was mentioned, we also have um, Tim Gaddy, who's the Programs Manager for Minatrista, is here. Um, Cassie Banning, horticulturalist. And I believe that Rebecca Holmquist was also planning to come um, as far as um, Minatrista is concerned. She's the Director of, of Programs. I'd also like to point out that uh, the Minatrista website will provide additional information about related art and lecture programs coming up at Minatrista, including a children's nature and garden art program on September 13th and a lecture on September 14th by Mark Zalonis, the director of Gardens and Grounds of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. I also want to extend a special acknowledgement to Cindy McCone for all of her efforts in having Patrick Doherty here today. Uh, invitations, itineraries. Uh, go ahead. Uh, trips to Indianapolis, uh, airport studio participation, press releases. There was a lot of work that went into this, and it's certainly much appreciated. I'm really delighted to have Patrick Doherty here today with us. Uh, when Cindy and I first started to talk about uh, having an environmental artist as a special participant to 
um, what has become an annual second year landscape architecture studio environmental art project um, uh, out at Minatrista, Patrick's name was certainly on the top of the list. Uh, Patrick has degrees from the University of Iowa and the University of North Carolina. His resume lists what he calls large-scale on-site temporary exhibitions at a very long list of major institutions, uh, museums, art centers, and botanical gardens across the country and in Europe. His work has graced the cover of Sculpture Magazine and been profiled in art and design journals um, and extensively in popular magazines and newspapers. Uh, the list of work, of reviews, and of speaking engagements is uh, very impressive. Most of you know that Patrick's most recent installation is in Indiana at the Indianapolis uh, Art Center Garden in Broad Ripple. Um, I think there's an intriguing relationship between landscape architecture and environmental art in, in a shared view of the potential of natural elements, um, earth and stone and plants, uh, to play starring roles in art and design. Patrick has a remarkable ability to celebrate the humble twig, branch, and sapling in imaginative and elegant ways. At risk of not giving our distinguished visitor a deservedly longer introduction, uh, we all are very anxious to look and to listen, so please welcome Patrick Doherty to Muncie and DeBall State. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to make a few comments, and then I will uh, show you some slides. You know, my son Sam, he's 11, and he has a children's book about three bears that encounter urban sprawl. Well, these bears go up over a hill near their house one morning. They look down, and somebody built a shopping center overnight. Well, already people are hustling and bustling up and down the sidewalk, and they all look so satisfied. Well, these little bears, they're not sure they're happy anymore. And so somewhere they find people clothes, in the next sequence of pictures, you see these little pint-sized figures moving amongst the legs of all the other passers-by, and the caption reads, well, now that they're like everybody else, are they really happy? Well, no, not really, because underneath those people clothes still beat their furry little animal hearts. Well, a big wind comes up, and it blows, and it blows, it blows men's ties up, women's skirts, and it blows all the little bears' clothes off. And for the first time, they actually realize who and what they are. Wow, they go tearing back across the parking lot, back to a place they could just be themselves. Well, it hadn't been so many years ago as a crow flies that I was getting ready for work. I had a coat and tie on and a briefcase, start down my walkway, and a really big wind comes up, and it blows and it blows. The first uh, gust blew my briefcase right down the street. The second blew off my coat and tie. The third blew everything else away. As I'm standing there, completely amazed at this unlikely turbulence in my life, the only thing I can feel under my people clothes is this thudding of an animal heart. And I have the flashbacks to all these times in my life when I imagine just giving up my regular life, going off into the distance, into the wilderness somewhere, building a small cabin, and just living in a more essential way. Well, it was a time of change for me. And I found myself at the how-to section of the library. And I saw things like load-bearing, R-factor, coefficient. I said, you know, building a house might be a whole lot harder than I thought. Well, luckily for me, as I start back across the library, I stumble on a stack of National Geographic. And maybe the first was an article about the barrios of Rio de Janeiro, in which a certain segment of the population has to go out and gather up the cast-offs and the dendritus of urban life, take it somewhere and build them somewhere to live. I said, I know I'm not supposed to like this because these are really poor people. And yet, you know, they'd done such an, a, a great job with the materials that they had at hand. And for me, it constituted a kind of raw aesthetic. Or maybe it was an article about a, a tribe in the Amazon basin who had to go in and forage in the jungle for the things that they needed. So, well, I know these huts don't have any running water or electricity, but they're beautiful. And they fit so well back into the environment from which the material was gathered. Or maybe it was a bird from Africa that had done an amazing engineering feat. I said, well, I know these birds are not smart enough to do this, yet in human terms, this would be considered amazing craftsmanship. That's when I realized that maybe I wasn't a normal builder. Maybe I was more of a hunter and gatherer or some kind of inspiration builder. And I did get started on that house, and I learned some things while building it that really stood me in good stead in my art life. 
You know, the first is learning to accept what you do. If you don't know much about building, you tend to put the window in in the morning, you look at it all day, by the end of the day, you're thoroughly disgusted with yourself. You're jerking it back out. So I decided that even before I began this process, that I was gonna do the very best job I could do. At the end of the day, I was gonna accept my progress and the next day I would build on it. The second thing is, if you use non-standard materials like so many sculptors do, you can't always go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy the things you need. And similarly, if you decide to cut down a big tree and use it as the mainstay of your house, how do you know it would work? And who would you ask? I played a game with myself called giving it my one best shot. And I said, hey, if I'm the last person on earth, what do I think? Do I think it will work? And somewhere along there, I began accepting responsibility for the kinds of things that I designed and made. The third thing is that working day in and day out in a very unselfconscious way, I slowly began to see what I liked and what I didn't like. I saw how important personal preference is in making those decisions. And over a period of time, I began to develop my own sense of personal aesthetic. And finally, I saw how important need was in getting anything done. I really needed this house. And so I was able to coalesce my best energies and direct my best problem solving skills. And sometimes when I have a sculptor friend who's not doing that well with their work, I say, you know, you have to figure out how to need it. Well, I didn't know it was getting out of hand, but my neighbors did. And they were always coming down to my house and scratching their head and kicking the dirt. And once my friend Brooks brought a person from another area of the country, and he says, I really like what you're doing here. You're a real artist. Well, maybe for you, for you all, that would be a wonderful thing for somebody to say to you. But for me, it felt like the edge of the earth, and I really wanted to take it back. And after worrying about it for a while, I realized upon reflection that as a child, I thought being an artist was the greatest thing you could possibly be. The only trouble was it came with an enormous sense of social responsibility. You were supposed to do something great, something earth-shaking, maybe something that saved people. And it was connected with that owner's word talent. You were supposed to really be talented. Well, I knew what that word talent and art had to do with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. I just couldn't figure out what it had to do with me or anything I was doing at my house. Well, one morning, as if by magic, I found myself enrolling in the nearest art department and taking sculpture courses in art history. And you know, for me, that minute, that day that I walked in that building was the best day of my life because I didn't know there was anybody else like me. I didn't know there were lots of people who liked making things, who liked handling things, and liked seeing their work get uh, created in three dimensions. The only trouble was I was kind of an art nerd and I'd walk around to everybody and I'd say, is this art? Is this art? How come this person gets to paint this board blue and call it art? I was just about to hold forth again when one of the professors grabs me by the thread and starts choking me and says, who in the hell cares if it's art or not? Why don't you just go in there and make whatever you want to make? Who's going to know the difference in 20 years anyway? You know, I needed that permission given. And I learned some things while I was in school that I think helped towards my continuation as a working artist. The first is the importance of a role model. Because I didn't know if you had to have a psychiatrist standing by when you made your first piece, or whether you had to get a divorce, or go to New York and work as a waiter in order to qualify. And it wasn't until I saw these relatively normal people who were intensely interested about making things, specifically sculpture, that I realized there was going to be some hope for me. The second thing, it's hard to be a food faddist unless there are other people around who eat beans and rice. And similarly, it's hard to be a working artist unless there are other people around who understand what you're going through. I think my biggest challenge as a working artist is to maintain a sense of personal equilibrium. And this is really hard in our society. It gives high marks to culture, but really ignores individual makers. And it's easy to have an identity crisis at any time in your career in which you walk into your studio and for just a moment you don't recognize who made the work. It's then that you're glad that there's an art department around or that you have an artist friend working in another part of the country and upon calling him, you're relieved and able to go back and really look at your work. The third thing is that I began to see there was a big difference between doers and viewers, between people who 
make things and people who look at them seriously. It looked like to me that it was two different jobs. You know, your museum, museum directors and curators and gallery owners, their job is to decide what uh, thing or person is more inherently interesting than another or where something fits in the lifeline of art. You know, that's not really my job. I have to be true to my ideas. I have to be true to the materials that I find. And if I started worrying about something being good or art historically significant before I begin, you know, I would just never get started. You know, it's at some shimmering moment, I decided that I was going to have to quit school, go home, and uh, build a studio and get to work. But you know, it's one thing to know that you have a right to make something, and it's another thing to know what you're going to make and how you're going to make it. Luckily for me, I had uh, kept up with the university. And I went to see a lecture by a woman named Marty Zelt, who had been a seamstress in her life before sculpture. Well, she brought Velcro fasteners and zippers and cloth to her work. And, you know, as I'm walking out of that lecture, I'm thinking, I wonder what I already know. I wonder what simple technology or some simple method of joining that I might be familiar with. I'm driving down the road back home, and I'm looking at all these saplings along the side of the road in the in North Carolina, maintenance crews are constantly striving to keep these down. And like Saul being struck off his horse on the way to Damascus, I, I kind of had an epiphasis. And I said, hey, maybe I could use those. Well, it wasn't so unusual that a woodsman like myself would see the potential of the saplings along his driveway because they're plentiful, they're renewable, and it's just like having a giant warehouse at your fingertips. After working this, with this material for a while, I realized that I had a deeper resonance with sticks. I had grown up in the woodlands of North Carolina, and we have lots of underbrush and intersecting lines. And while some kids laid on the ground and looked for formations and clouds, I found myself looking at the drawing quality of the winter landscape, looking up in the winter branches, maybe seeing a picture or, or maybe a face up there. So when I turned to sculpture, it seemed easy to co-opt the forces of nature and play all that energy out onto the large surfaces of these of these gestural pieces that I make. Before I could get going, I had to figure out what birds and beavers and other natural shelter builders know about sticks. And that is that they have an inherent method of joining. If you drag a stick through the woods, you'll see what I mean. It entangles with everything. You end up starting like this, and before long, you're pulling it along. That's really the simplest method of joining. And sticks have a little flexibility, so if you flex them and pull them through a matrix, you let them go. They snap back and hold themselves in place. Well, that's the how, but the what. If you had seen me at the time, you would have taken complete mercy on me. I could spend maybe 10 minutes in a museum without running down the steps with sweaty palms and a headache and going, you know, I think they've used all the good ideas up. Or you could read an art magazine for maybe 10 seconds and you say, you know, they've exploited every material. Or you would hear that you know, in New York City alone, in the last census, over a million people claim to be visual artists. You say, whoa, there's too many of us. But after worrying about this for a while, I realized that I love to make things. I decided that, you know, the art world was just going to have to lump it. Before I uh, show you a few slides, I'd like to say two other things. One about the art world in general, and two about creativity. You know, for me, the art world is not a wall. What it is is a loosely knit group of people in jobs. They're good people, people like you and I. And they don't tell artists what they have to do. Artists have to decide what they want to do. And there's not one artist in the world that hadn't fantasized to being about being taken to New York City in a fiery chariot where they and their work get what they deserve. The only trouble was, is we all want different things. Some people want to live in a certain place. They want a certain kind of car. They want a certain kind of family life. And it's these real world decisions that help determine what our priorities are and what we allow ourselves to be available to. The second thing is that I have a pair of clippers and I arrive and three weeks later I have to have a good piece. So I've thought a little bit about creativity. <clears throat> the first is that, that hysteria rides on the shoulder of every creative person. And so if you just want to go somewhere and get started, you have to figure out how to dominate all that hysterical energy and direct it in the right way. The second thing is that I know that I have different states of being. I have a state of being in which I do my laundry and eat my dinner, 
I have another state of being, a door behind which all my problem solving skills lay. And the question is how to go over and open that door immediately. Well, I think we've all been there because if you, if I'm in North Carolina on a Friday night, I get together with my friends and I notice a change of state as the cares of the week drop away, people start to be incredibly funny. They say really funny things. And, and I say, I wonder why we're not on some kind of national talk show or something. But I think the state for making, the best state for making, is where a person feels very unselfconscious, but fully themselves. And that's the state of making that I see. It's not about anxiety. It's more a state of feeling free and being with your friends. I say about my work that I do large scale temporary work, which I build on site from materials that I gather in the nearby landscape. To do this work requires patience. It requires commitment to one's own ideas, the ability to work creatively with the administration and staff of the organization, a desire to intrigue and entertain the public. But mainly I like seeing my ideas get worked out in a big public way. You know, all my work is made in public. There's no doors to close and no, no, uh, no place to hide. And the public has complete access to the process. Now for some artists that would be pretty consternating and confining, but I've learned to think of that as, as kind of a cultural exchange, one in which those people in that place are somehow folded back into the sculptures that I'm building. You know, when I'm on site, I enjoy representing making in a positive way. I enjoy demystifying the process, but I enjoy interceding for the arts. But mainly, I like reminding the public that artists are just normal people who are looking for their rightful place in the world of work. So I'm going to show you a few slides. We're going to dim the lights a little bit. This is my house in North Carolina. I live in Chapel Hill. It's a very simple house, but it's really served me well as an artist. I've gathered uh, lots of uh, used materials to build it, took down tobacco barns and other kind of log cabins. This is my first stone job back here. I dug the stones in my backyard, and uh, it gave me an opportunity to really start thinking about materials. Sorry, lights clear. But from this, you know, I, I can look at that wall, and I know the bottom is not as good as the top because I, I remember not knowing what I was doing. Now, uh, I don't have a photo of it, but I put a porch out there so that it's a little, uh, a little more grayed from, from the outside to the end. But I've taken the, the sticks from my own woods, my first hunting and gathering experience, and, and split the cedars out and used them in a kind of a southwestern way and done all my, my ceilings with these uh, red cedar. And so they bleach out and they just make a very nice a very nice ceiling that is uh, maintenance free. This is uh, my wall from the inside and I, I'm using a kind of uh, mortar technique in which I sponge the mortar off and rake it back into the cracks so that it looks a little bit like it's just laid up. And as I continue to clear different pieces of property and this was my front yard I decided to make these kinds of sheds out of sticks and the idea of kind of garnering the materials from wherever you're working uh, started you know, uh, emerging and since then I've made lots of stick sheds for, uh, of all configurations for my neighbors. And one thing is that I wasn't convinced that people were gonna make a monument to me so I decided to make one to myself and this is a, a big, stone carn that's about uh, eight feet on a side and eight feet tall and it is a, simply a laid up stone wall, stone cube. And I, I think of good stonework as, as uh, having lots of different sizes and lots of different colors and I picked up all these stones on my way to town and back. Just uh, 
fi finding them just in the shape that I have used them. Now, my neighbors have been inspirational to me because they're always saying when, when my children leave home, something good is going to happen. I'm going to do something. So this is called Waiting It Out in Maple. And I've got a lot of neighbors, so I, I put them out <laughs> at, on the front so they could see themselves. I wanted to show you a, a few materials pictures because when you see the pieces that I build, you imagine that they are these huge long lines, 20, 30 feet long. But generally, the most uh, the, the materials that I use are short. And these are maples, and they're sitting outside my, my studio. And maple is a favorite uh, twig that infiltrates everywhere along the East Coast. So you can always find red maple. Uh, so I've used that. This is my friend Scott, and we're about to start an installation, and this is the way the material looks every time. This was an interior piece, so I'm making addition subtraction. I'm just taking it off the pile and working on the piece directly. But this was at the, now well, let's see here. I didn't do that. This is at the Heron School of Art, and over but when they were in their old building. And uh, Indianapolis, uh, we found that the city was expanding their golf course. So they were allowing us to go and gather these red maple off of the place they were just about to cut. And this repeats itself again and again. We have to get the materials from our site to where we're going to work again and again. And this is what I consider a great pile of sticks. That was what was on the truck there. And so this is out in front of the heron just before our beginning process. I wanted to show you a piece from start to finish. This is in Ireland, and it's a, it's a willow farm. And you know, in the Middle Ages and, beyond, and before, uh, people raised sticks for various things that they needed. They needed them to help interweave their walls of their house, to make baskets from, to bind the top of radishes, to put in the and the bottom of the dikes, and just there was just tons of uses of, of saplings. And what happens is, <clears throat> if you cut the stool of this, that's that stump there, you get twice as many sticks. So for 40 years, you can raise one stump, and you can gather about every three years. So this is this is an Ireland of the Willow Farm, and this is the great sticks. Here we're taking the materials. Uh, city truck come came over to help us. I'm working at Tower Community Arts Center, and it was in a rough section of Dublin, and so they didn't want me to work on the street. So I had to work behind this wall. My commitment was to allow the public to still see this piece. So I chose this tree and decided to use a kind of vernacular architecture there in Ireland is the Irish Round Tower, which the monks built in the 8th to the 10th century, and they're really tall, thin towers without you know, any real reason. They're inexplicable. And uh, this is my scaffolding situation. It's more elaborate than most, but it goes up about 40 feet because I needed to work on top of the tree. And this is my Irish round tower. This was on the only, it's not sunny. This is only kind of sunny. And this was the sunniest day I had when I was in Ireland. That was my helper there. And uh, we built it in three weeks. And this is... Uh, one of the nice features of it is because you could go up and look up in it and see this tree that's been encased by these other kind of smaller limbs. And finally, this is its look after two years. The, the real uh, living limbs were left outside the piece, and, uh, and so then it finally came down. I wanted to show you how I work. This is a piece at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design in which I've used the Old County Jail, which was about to become the library. I love the fact they ripped the roof off and that you could look at the sky from outside the building. But they allowed me to work on this surface. The piece is about oh, 35 feet long and about 32 feet high from the ground. And uh, so since it was a jail, I thought, well, I might make an es you know, escape hatches or some kind of flying carpet or, or something like that. But um, the way I work, is I work structurally first. Well, I thought I was going to work structurally. I'm sorry. I'm going to see if that goes there. I'm sorry. I work structurally first. 
And uh, what that means is that I have to go in and lay down some kind of structure. In this case, I'm, I'm weaving into these jail bars from both sides in order to hang this piece on there. You can see that I vaguely started outlining some of the circularity. So I work structurally first. And then as I get a, as I get enough of, a, this thing is great. As I get enough of a structure to hold the piece, then I start thinking aesthetically. I don't think, well, will this piece stay together? I know it will stay together because I've got a good structural base. Then I start adding lines in ways that I think will make the piece look good. So you can see I'm continuing with these kind of big circularity. Finally, what I do is work cosmetically. I go back and I tuck in all the little ends or I do a basic erasing process that if I see things I don't like, I put little tiny limbs on them that you just kind of erase all the, all the cut ends. And this, these nice white lines came from alongside of railroad track. On my way to work one morning, I see these about a little bit of about as much as this stage. And I said, God, could we call and get permission to gather those sticks? And they were all about 20, 25 feet long. And so I was immediately able to pick this piece up and use it by, by placing these emphasis lines on it and it really helped with the feeling that I wanted. These kind of circularities were really made by just finding, by chance, these really nice white lines. You know, I wanted to talk about my work in terms of temporary, <clears throat> because I only make temporary work. That, what that's allowed me to do is capitalize on many non-art spaces and many non-sculptural spaces where nobody thought about having a sculpture. In this case, it's a little town in North Carolina, and I bent down this pink and white dogwood and I've woven this thing over the top of it, this kind of big uh, shape. And you can see that the, that the flowers are leafing out on, uh, on top of it. Well, about two months later, the leaves come, and we knew from an arborist that we were going to, in fact, have to take the piece down. So this is reproduced time and time again. We're going to pull it off. And this is what it looks like on the inside, a kind of snagging. It really doesn't have wire or rope to tie it together. That's, that's the way it looks. It hooked itself together. And then this is the way, well, let's see here. I think it's turned itself off again. This is the, this is the way it, it, uh, it looks on the outside. And we're about to pull it down the road to the dump, like the nose cone of a rocket. Uh, this is a piece at Swarthmore College called Abracadabra. And again, a scaffolding nightmare. But the thing that was great about this tree, it's right in the center of campus, but it had no limbs on one side and plenty of limbs on the other. So I was able to capitalize on those limbs to make this illusion of stacking these pieces to the top of the tree. And that was its winter configuration. And this is what eventually happened. The tree was ready to come down before I started. So they, they gave it two years, and then they decided to, to take it down, producing these dramatic takedown pictures. I thought the piece still looked in pretty good shape after two years, so, but uh, it had to come down in its final fall there. This was a piece in Denmark in a nature park in which you could only use natural materials. And when I saw other artists looking around there for something to do, I realized that when man looks at nature, he seeks his own reflection. So this is called Little Big Man. He's seeking his own reflection in this, in this lake. And he sprung into these, these dead uh, trees there. And you could crawl up inside his body and go up and look out the face. The great thing was that in the winter, you had the area flood. And it made another kind of uh, piece that uh, was and, you know, the Danish people connected with the myth of, of something rising out of the water, some kind of a water sprite or something. But its final demise came. My parents-in-law went back to Denmark two years later, and here's the old soldier fell down. And the thing from my, from my mind, that looks better than the original piece. I just couldn't have pulled it off myself. I had to have nature help me. And this was a piece at Frederick Meyer Garden uh, called Juggernaut. And it was my attempt to make uh, space jugs. And there are actually three of them. And, uh, but here are their demise. We, 
we put those things far enough from the building that in a normal year, the snow would not jump on them and kill them. But they had about a five foot snow came tearing down the roof and made these screaming forms. They really look like they're so unhappy now. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, was a piece in, uh, in uh, South Carolina, the South Carolina Botanical Garden, built on the, the concept of Bramante's Tempe, Tempe Echo in Rome. But what I've done here is I, as I installed the piece, I've planted living trees in the walls uh, with, with the idea of just continuing a little bit further so that eventually the sticks would rot away and you would have this little remembrance of the initial uh, sculpture. Uh, this was about five years later. Of course, the entire site had changed. They put a road in. Lots of different things had happened. But the, the sticks are starting, that were the living ones, were starting to exert themselves. This was seven years later. And now it just looks like a little grove of trees there. I wanted to talk about my work in terms of drawing because what I think carries the uh, burden of the illusions in the work is the drawing quality. That you have to use all of the, all of the uh, techniques that you can think of as a, as a drawing person to pull it off. And not only do these, these sticks have a uh, you know, connection with the real world and the backyard material you know and the bird nest you've seen and the National Geographic you've looked at, but there are lines with which to draw. This was a piece that was hung in these rafters. They're woven above the light track about 10 feet. They're actually hung there. You can push them and they move. And I think it's a really good il illustration of a kind of the drawn quality. I've used uh, rosario or red twig dogwood and willow that I gathered nearby. And it just shows the subtlety of the line quality that you can achieve in, in, in working with this material. I really like this piece so much. And this was, uh, this is at the, actually at the World Trade Center in New York City. And what I learned was that some, sometime your adversity actually produces the best piece because I went there and the Port Authority said, well, you can work here as long as you don't touch the walls, the floors, or the ceilings with those sticks. So I had looked around and I saw the electricians were working on wooden ladders. So it gave me this idea of, of this big city calligraphy, a kind of big drawing. And one of the things about uh, what the failure of public art often is, is that they just don't fit the scale of the space they're in. So one of the advantages of working line by line is the ability to adjust the scale and up it if you feel like that you, you know, you're, you're taking on too big of a lobby. So I was just able to keep adding ladders until I thought that I had one of, a, of appropriate size. This is at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and I'm out on the roof looking down through the oculus of the building. I like this because this is kind of building as drawing or architecture as drawing, and then I've filled it up with this, these kind of small linear elements, the, the center core. And I was able to build this piece by working from a platform lift from within and then having a spotter on the stairs because oftentimes if I'm allowed to work there, they just go the whole hog and let me work while people are walking and I have, it's my responsibility not to injure anyone. So <clears throat> this was at the uh, American Craft Museum in New York and again, playing off the, the building as a drawing and uh, you can see this was looking up through to the lobby and one of my favorites is just catching some of the innuendo of the stairway and the flow there in the top of the sculpture itself. <coughs> and this is in Denmark looking out on the North Sea. It's called Running in Circles. And you turn a sharp corner and then you see this in the, this line of poplar trees. And I've just gone right across the road and got some, some uh, Norwegian maple and some willow and brought it over and just set up a scaffolding and just made this piece pretty quickly. And then this was its summer configuration so that you still kind of have a window uh, out to the North Sea. I've worked in three different ways and I'd just like to talk briefly about each one. The first thing I've done is I've kind of worked with architecture and built things into architecture in the sense that I've found purchase points in the architecture that would help support the work. This was at the decor of a museum in Lincoln, Mass. And I had a kind of a private fantasy that this was a tower falling back to its form of origin as a surf hut. And uh, so 
So I, uh, the tower is about 70 feet tall. So it was, it was hard to work up there. And my method of working was to build a mock-up of the tower on the ground and then take a crane and pick it up and drop it on the top of the building. So I try to look for people that don't know enough to say no. <laughs> so, and besides, a crane operator worked for this museum. So I had two things going for me. The only trouble was is that when I, when I built it on the ground, I was looking straight at the sticks. But if you looked at the same sticks 70 feet up, they looked too dinky and wispy. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking really big, fat sticks up there, and I'm reinvesting the surface with some sticks that you can really see. And so you can see from this picture that I put all those sticks in finely so that it would have a more meaty, powerful, drawn look. And this was a, a piece in Florida. It's called Easy Does It, kind of the insect world, and uh, leaning up against this kind of Floridian building. And what I do is I start the sticks for those spheres all the way in the ground. And then they come up, and I, I scaffold the whole thing and just build them in place so that there's more integrity to the whole piece. This is a piece in England at Manchester City Art Gallery. And uh, you know when, when architects think about the beginning of, of architecture, they often think big bundles of sticks. And what remains of that kind of concept is in this column of this classical building are all these organic lines. And so that in itself gave me the idea of, of, of putting this kind of welcoming uh, garden gate on this building. Uh, it's called riprap. And so it, what it is, it, it's, it, when you deal with historic buildings, there's no nails. You can't put anything in there. There was a big hole in the front of the steps. And I jammed the sticks down in the hole and then bent them around the back of the column. So you have to be really tricky and, and problem solve these things in order to make it work. Uh, this is a piece in, at Seattle, Washington at the Henry Art Museum. They've got a new museum now, but before their entrance had a little Islamic dome in it. And uh, you know, Seattle is a rainy spot. And so I was one of a number of artists working there and they said, well, we don't have any more room in the museum. So I said, hey, could I work up in that dome there and maybe in front of the secretary's desk downstairs? So, they, so this is about, that's about 20 foot of sticks from the edge of the roof up. And I used a platform lift and some tricanery to hold those things in there. And the piece skeins off and goes downstairs. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, it must be kind of a Woods Park par uh, cyclotron that's throwing some kind of particle. And these kids came by and said, oh, we know what it is. It's an upside down plate of spaghetti and the meatball fell in the basement. So I suggest you ask your children to title your work. There's my meatball. And you can see I've used passively everything. I've used the architecture. I went over the steam pipe. I pressed against the wall. I've just used everything that was there without having to put any nails or anything in the wall. So that, for me, is kind of a challenge. I'm going to my second one now. Uh, this was 1708 uh, East Main in Richmond, and uh, the piece is called Turnabout is Fair Play. It was an artist-run space. Nobody knew what happened because they had their offices to the front. They allowed me to work on the street, and so I agreed to do it if we would leave the door open the whole time. So this allowed, uh, the piece goes through the transom of the building up through above the door and works its way. We moved the Xerox machine temporarily so that we could get the piece in there and it becomes this kind of big welcoming cornucopia. Now, oftentimes I have to use fire retardant because of the flammability, particularly inside or anything touches a building. And so in this case, this flame retardant also uh, held the color of the leaves. So this is about six months after, and you see the leaves are still kind of vibrant, and you see the piece coming from the street in the window there. This was... Uh, called Shrub Geranian, and it's uh, about 25 feet high and 50 feet on the side. And using this space in, an, in a, uh, you know, an uncharacteristic way, I'd seen sculptures on the court, but never in the top of the court. And I wove it into the superstructure. It was a girder ceiling, latticework ceiling, and was able to make this kind of maelstrom of sticks. Uh, 
The second way I've worked is with trees. And this is a uh, piece in Japan. And I was allowed to live in this little Shinto shrine and gather the twigs or the small reeds behind the shrine and then build this work. And this tree was planted the day the shrine was built. It's 400 years old. And in Japan, often they'll wrap a sacred tree with a big rice rope. And so that gave me the idea of kind of, uh, of making this tree into kind of, a, and then having this ceremonial garb around it, kind of a rope, uh, kind of a cornucopia. And somebody came to visit me, and you see I've used all of the, the things in the verge of the tree to just help me with holding the piece up. It's these giant forest bamboo that was growing right on the site. And here back in Florida where you have to be, the grass is sacred, so you had to get, I had to get the pieces up on their tiptoes so they could mow. And it allowed me to, to think about working into this big live oak tree. Uh, this is a Leylandia hedge in England, and uh, it appears that this is a solid hedge. And what it is is these really big trees that are closely touching. But what that means is there are these huge cathedral-like spaces between those trees. All you have to do is step in, and you're like totally amazed. So I put these skylights into those big spaces so that you could start into this warren and walk all the way down this shrub, and then you would have all this illumination from above. So that's how you get in the thing. And uh, another tree piece in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, the, uh, the idea that you would have to read up a piece. Most people won't look up in the tree. You have to lead their eye up there. And so when you go into the building, then you realize how big these pieces are. They're about 50 feet high and about 12 or 15 feet circles. And, and they, did under, they did make it through at least one near-miss hurricane. And uh, so... I, I kind of consider them a roller coaster for squirrels, and I pull the trees from two different limbs from two different trees and kind of weave over both limbs, and so I have this continuity from tree to tree. And this was uh, in, uh, it's called family trees, and suggesting a reciprocity between these bigger trees and these young whippersnappers, and uh, oftentimes I will use limbs from the winter and from the spring. And so the insides of these things are festooned with all the summer leaves and the outside have winter limbs because it's, it's right on the cusp of a season change. And just dealing with a sense of gesture and trying to understand a kind of uh, sympathy between these two, this live tree and this other kind of object. Uh, I, I wanted to say that I've not only use trees to hold things, but I've used the overtones of trees. So this is a kind of piece of architecture, like an architectural folly, but I'm really placed it under this tree so that it gains some kind of value from the tree itself. And you can see that you look up in there and you can see these mother limbs up there. They dropped all the Spanish moss down on, onto this, uh, this thing and it made it really look so good. Uh, here, there, this was at the University of Cincinnati. It's called Threadbare. And, and just giving the sense of, of uh, every, at least American kid's drawing starts with a kind of a log cavity looking very simple drawing. And so I suggest in kind of, you know, dependence on trees, uh, just kind of uh, using these, these kind of kid drawing starting points. And a, a piece in Denmark in the Botanical Garden in Copenhagen, and there again, it depends on this big poplar tree behind it to give it a kind of overtone. And this is uh, actually down in uh, New Harmony right now, if you all happen to pass through there. I think this is one of the best pieces I've ever made because it's a hornbeam hedge and it didn't have any under limbs. And so I was able to slip these pieces like a cave dwelling in under the, this kind of uh, uh, mohawk. And, uh, and, and it's right at, in, the cor in the middle of town. It used to be on the old uh, commons of, uh, of New Harmony. And this is its winter configuration. So, you know, a lot of times the, the season change has a big interplay with your sculpture uh, in terms of changing its meaning and giving it some, some new um. Uh, this is a piece in Hawaii that also is using kind of the overtones of this big monkey pod tree. 
it also goes up in the tree and kind of intertwines in the top of the tree. But, but generally, it takes its form from reflection against the, of these huge uh, trunk systems. And a piece in, in um, somewhere <laughs> in Wisconsin <laughs> that I just built it. I should know this piece. Uh, and anyway, it goes through. It's a series of big cone shapes that go through uh, a harbor vitae hedge. And it is fantastic architecture when you're inside because they're 30 feet tall and you're standing in these very, very tall cone shapes. It's, it's really fun. There's my mug there. Um, also, and finally, I've worked with uh, things in ways that I've had to produce architecture because people will say, that's all we've got. You either work here in the front or you don't work at all for all. So I've come up with different ways of working that allow me to build independent of trees or of architecture, uh, uh, architectural support. But this is in uh, England and it was in a place where there were lots of standing stone and Neolithic graves and so this, it's just a bit reflective of that and that you can walk inside each piece and into this big interior courtyard. What I liked about it was the season change. I, I dare not try to focus this. That would be a terrible mistake. Um, so, but anyway, you can see how that seasonal change and also as uh, I told you, this looks like a good introduction. Uh, the, um, the seasonal change and also just the time, about six months had passed and the relaxation of these limbs made nature work on it and made it even a little bit better than I could do. It has a more relaxed form, a more interesting interplay between the forms. This was a piece in, uh, in Japan as well, and I worked with a landscape architect. He started on one end, I started on the other, and we, we just met in the middle. So mine is, uh, he has riprap as his tradition. I had Dorothy in Kansas as my tradition. And uh, we use split forest bamboo. I mean, you see, I left mine partly unsplit and split part of it and just used this uh, special tool. It's a hand tool for splitting. You can split five, seven, or nine uh, slats by just pulling hard on it and splitting these long 40-foot pieces. It's really fun. Uh, this was in Madison, Wisconsin. It's called Dixie Cups. You have to build for the weather because, uh, you know, when you get heavy snow loads and lots of climbing, like if you're on a college campus and you put it in front of a dorm, you know things are going to happen. And uh, so anyway, these pieces are made so that their tops are open, they can take the snow, and they can take a bunch of punishment. And uh, they lean on each other, so that adds support. But I love the, I love the uh, light that went with these things. That's the snow configuration. And uh, also I've learned to use things in groups. Uh, this is Northern Illinois University in the snow and making these kind of, I don't know, some kind of tall chimney type shapes that lean on each other and add to the stability of the whole group. Uh, sometimes I have to work inside in ways that I can't touch the walls or floors of this, uh, you know, uh, I can't support from the the architectural structure. This is in Belgium, and I built these big uh, kind of things. They're called sleepwalking, and uh, you know, they're just an enormous amount of material. They're about 27 feet tall, and those big knobs at the top are, are kind of the way it holds together. It's based on a kind of a tripod. I took lots of sticks and put them down, and then took the others and put them up, and then made a big bundle out of them, and then stood the bundle up, and then uh, stabilized it covered over so that it has a sense of, of laciness over the tripod. Uh, a piece from Lamar Sculpture Park in St. Louis, uh, uh, idea of refaciding this manor with a village concept, kind of ignoring the orders of the pond, the bushes, and have these kind of, this kind of village parading along and kind of ignoring the orders of the yard. This is at Bowdoin College. It's called Simple Pleasures. And uh, again, hooking these things together at the hip. Sometimes, and for no reason at all, the folks at Bowdoin thought that homeless people would come and live in this. 
I don't even know if there are any homeless people there. So my, my requirement was to make something that people couldn't sleep in. So you could sleep standing up in these. There's a lot of room above you, but not much room on the floor. So sometimes, uh, you know, just practicality and the, and the sponsor's need figure into the kind of designs you make. There's this winter configuration. And a piece in uh, Austria in which it's called From the Castle's Kitchen, in which I found these little pottery shards in the, in the castle's kitchen garden and then went and researched some German country pottery and built these things. And this is at the uh, New Tacoma Glass Museum, uh, Glass Museum in Tacoma, Washington. And these just came down, uh, but with the idea of, of having some kind of amphores or something that referenced glass at least. And, uh, and they uh, work with this huge tool that they have there. There's the other, just looking the other way. They stayed up for about two years. I had to be very tricky there. They were pouring a concrete slab next to me. And so you can see at the base of these pieces, I put a piece of plastic down and poured my own slab on top of their slab, left some holes around the edges and put some big, big sticks down in those holes. And that's what it was holding it up. So that, you know, uh, you, you have to be kind of tricky to make these things work. That was at the, Airport in, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It's called Standby. And, and a piece in uh, the South Carolina Botanical Gardens. I had a horticulture class help me, and they provided quite a bit of gathering help, and they had these big guys that would move my scaffolding all day. So they had this really nice, large folly. And there I'm working on it. And this was uh, made a similar thing at Smith College. And this is its winter configuration. It's really a different kind of piece, but it did have the three, three towers going for it. And that's this kind of interior look. That's kind of the look that I remember looking up in the trees in North Carolina when I was a child. I wanted to talk about my work a little bit because uh, in, a, in a way that uh, photographers love to take their work without any people in them. But that's not the way the work is used. This was at the Children's Museum in, in Richmond. It's based on a series of African granaries. And um, I mean, the thing was just mobbed every second of the day. This was in Germany this year, um, built this piece in uh, Osnabrück. And there again, I've made it and had to work with the public coming by and looking at it all day long. It takes advantage of one of their city gates. And uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana, I uh, made a kind of series of tree houses for a, a show that they were having there. I, I made those trees on the street. I dug a five foot hole, went to the river, got some big sycamores that are about a foot across the bottom, put them down in there, filled it up, and then built some tree houses in them. And the things you can see, the leaves are coming out, even after all that. It's like a big flower pot. But people really looked at this thing. And this was, uh, I was at the uh, University of Michigan, and this is my normal work site, people walking around, talking to me, looking, and uh, asking me what I'm doing, and uh, kind of an entertainment thing. But I really enjoy that mix. Thank you very much. I, I, if you have a question or two, I could take it. If you don't want to, if you don't, you think you have the time? Maybe five minutes? Yeah. Say it again, please. Well, you know, kudzu scares everybody. And a few times that I said, well, we could make these forms and grow the kudzu over it. It was not a popular thought. <laughs> yeah, uh huh. Yeah, 
the, the question is, is that would, uh, would the organization uh, resist letting the public view the pieces uh, while they're being made? But uh, what the trade-off is, is the drama of building is uh, very interesting to people and brings more people to look at the piece. Uh, and so generally what we do is we, I'm not usually in a gallery. I'm usually out in front of the museum or in the lobby or you know, maybe a botanical gardens. And so we, we, we start from the very beginning thinking about it being something that people could walk up and look at and talk. And <clears throat> I've had enough experience that I can pretty much assure the safety of the public these, any individual stick is not that big of a, of a heavy load, you know. So we are, we have to sequence our work sometimes so that we work around the busiest times. But uh, generally, the trade-off has been uh, uh, curators are really interested in having the additional interest in the work and the attention on the organization. So, um, and, and generally, a certain kind of person calls me too, you know. So uh, maybe I wouldn't fit in everyone's within everyone's parameters. We were talking about it in class today, and what I do is uh, generally I try to remember how I feel when I first see a site, and uh, I, I also try to be informed by people talking to me. They say, well, we think you ought to put a piece over here and, and all this. So they, they also have been looking around, so I'm not, I try to be aware of, of all the help I can get. And then I'll make word associations with the site and try to chum the water and get myself thinking, what do I think about when I'm here? Then I'll make thumbnail sketches, and I read into those sketches. They're not really line-by-line -line drawings. I'll go, oh, I must have meant this. Oftentimes, I'll just see a little fleck on there that maybe, uh, you know, something fell out of my hair onto the paper. I said, oh, yeah, that's it, you know, because I'm trying to imagine into the, the drawing. And, and then I work on the, the logistics of something because I've got I've to be realistic about how to build it, where I'm getting the material, how I'm going to get the material there, who's going to help me, and the sponsors, their ideas, oftentimes they'll say, well, we want just the one just like we saw over there, and I'll say, no, you really don't. You want my best work. we got to do something new. 